right, this year, biology students, unit three and four, let's start going through the key knowledge, starting with um, outcome one. So on completion of this unit, the student should be able to explain the dynamic nature of cells in terms of key cellular processes, including regulation, photosynthesis and cellular respiration, and analyze factors that affect the rate of biochemical reactions. Let's have the first key knowledge is plasma membranes. So we need to make sure that we know the fluid mosaic model of the structure of the plasma membrane and the movement of hydrophilic and hydrophobic substances across it based on their size and polarity. We have to know different organelles, including ribosomes, endoplasmic reticulum, the apparatus and associated vesicles in export of protein produced from cells through exocytosis. And then finally, we need to know cellular engulfment of material by endocytosis. We are going to use this word document when it's not all shaded to help us. So let's begin. Okay, starting in the top left corner, we have a diagram of a cell membrane that we need to label. So I'm just going to throw the labels up there quickly and talk through them. Okay, alphabetically, starting at A, A points to this structure with the bobble for a head and ziggy zag legs and then asks you to identify what A1 and A2 is. It, of course, is a phospholipid. And then A1 is the head and um, the phosphate head, and A2 is the fatty acid chains. One detail that might also be worth adding to the head and the tails is the fact that the head is hydrophilic, meaning it likes water, and the fatty acid chain is hydrophobic. So I've just added those details down the bottom. And also said um, that polar molecules are generally hydrophilic and non-polar mo molecules are generally hydrophobic. All right, let's have a look at B. If you have a close look at this structure, you can see that you've got a phospholipid, the phosphate head and the two lipid chains attached to these hexagon things. Now, these hexagon things are supposed to re re represent sugar molecules. So we're dealing with a carbohydrate here. Because of the carbohydrate group, it gets the name glyco. And because of the lipid down here, it gets the name lipid, so glycolipid. Okay, so structure C, I've got a big round blob. So I'm going to assume that's a globular protein. But on top of it, you can see another carbohydrate chain or flag. So, um, but it has D pointing to it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to call C a glycoprotein because it's got the sugar attached to it. But I'm going to call D um, the carbohydrate flag. Remember that these carbohydrate flags act as markers on the outside of the cell. Um, so that'll help us label it H and I in a second. Okay, this next structure is E. We can see it's embedded at odd occasions. There's a few of them in this particular plasma membrane diagram. And it's got this um, structure where it looks like a few, well, not hexagons, but some pentagons as well, joined very closely together. Um, and it sort of makes this sort of ziggy zag shape. So that, to me, is cholesterol. F is just a protein. Um, it looks like it's embedded in the membrane, so I might call it an integral protein. Whereas this one over here, which hasn't got a letter name, I'd call a peripheral protein because it's to the side. Okay, G points to this sort of tunnel going right through the membrane. So we're going to call that one a transmembrane protein because it cuts right through. So it would act as um, a channel for molecules to get through. I just wrote that up there because I'd pretty much run out of room in there. And then finally, we've got H to I. Now, to me, this could be labeled a few different ways. I'm not sure if it's indicating the bilipid layer in everything or um, the inside and the outside of the cell. Because it's got two separate letters, I'm going to say that one's trying to show that this is the outside of the cell and I is trying to show that this is the inside of the cell. And I can tell that H is the outside because of um, those carbohydrate flags that tend to stick towards the outside of the cell. Okay, and that's those. Let's go to the next box. Okay, the next box, and this is an, a question that could possibly appear on the exam, asks you to explain how the term fluid mosaic model describes the structure of the plasma membrane. So what I would do if I were you, I would break this down into um, key parts of that term, looking at key keywords in it. And the first part of the term is fluid. Now if something is fluid it means it's not static, it's not stuck, it's able to move. 
And what you need to realize is um, the bilipid layer, the two layers are able to slide over the top of each other. And the other molecules embedded within, like the cholesterol and the proteins, are able to sort of float through and even move across between the two layers in the case of some proteins. So that's why it's fluid, is because the molecules are capable of moving around inside the structure. Second part of the term is mosaic. Um, a mosaic means it's made up of a lot, of, a lot of little parts. You can see there are a lot of little parts. There's your um, phospholipids, your proteins, bits of cholesterol, um, some glycoproteins, some glycolipids hanging up there. So it's made up of a lot of different components. So again, if you see that question in an exam, break it down into its, its components. Fluid, because it can move. Mosaic, because it's made up of lots of little bits. Okay, so that leads on into the next little bit. How does the fluid mosaic model allow for membrane transport? When this question talks about membrane transport, it's talking about how molecules can move across the membrane. Now, how these molecules move across the membrane depends on a couple of factors, um, their size, the polarity, and a few other things. We're going to get into that in more detail. But because this membrane has is made up of a lot of, a lot of different parts, it means there's different avenues for different molecules to get across. And because it's fluid, it means sometimes there's gaps and some things can move straight through it. Okay, so that's my attempt to put that into words. Molecules can move across the plasma membrane because it's made up of a lot of different parts. This creates specific paths for different molecules to get across. Also, because the plasma membrane can move, there's tiny gaps that let some molecules straight through. Okay, before we move across, let's talk about hydrophilic versus hydrophobic. The best way to approach this is to break down the words. So hydro means water, philic means loving, so it's attracted to water. And that's generally because it's a polar molecule. Hydrophobic, hydro for water, phobic being a fear of, um, so it's repelled from water. And of course, that's generally nonpolar um, molecules. A great example is oil. Oil is hydrophobic. You put olive oil in water or try to make a salad dressing, it just sits on the top. That's because it doesn't want to mix with the water. It's water fearing. Okay, so there's those details there. Water loving, attracted to water molecules because it is polar. Water fearing, repelled from water molecules because it is nonpolar. Okay, now let's look at how things get across this membrane. So we've got passive up here and down here. Maybe you can see there's a little bit of active membrane transport. Remember, the difference between these two is whether or not they require energy, which is generally in the form of ATP. These three, diffusion, facilitated diffusion, and osmosis, none of them require energy. So I'm going to add that detail there. Okay, so let's start with diffusion. This is the simplest version of all of the th way things move across membranes. And it is the net, means overall, passive, means requires no energy, movement of molecules across a semi-permeable membrane, i.e. the plasma membrane, from an area of high concentration of these molecules to an area of low concentration. Okay, so um, the question also asks us to draw a diagram. So I'm going to do that um, here. First thing I'm going to represent is my semi-permeable membrane, which I might draw with a sort of a perforated line. Okay, and I'm going to label it, and I might write plasma membrane to give... Um, the reader some perspective of what I'm drawing. The next thing I need is some molecules to move. So I'm going to draw them with these orange blobs to represent the molecule. I'm going to pretend it's small enough to get through that perforation. All right, so I've quite purposefully made it so that there is um, a definite difference in the concentration gradient. You can see there's a lot of these orange blobby molecules on one side, not so many on the other side. What you need to realize is that, ooh, let's not take you, maybe we'll take you. Because there's so many over here, some of them are naturally going to want to move over to this side of the plasma membrane. They're going to follow the concentration across. And you'd represent that. Obviously, you can't pick up dots and move them on your exam paper. So you would represent that with um, just an arrow showing the movement. All right, facilitated diffusion. Now, this is essentially the same as um, diffusion, but the problem is these molecules are often too big a charge or too big in size to get straight across a plasma membrane. So instead, they rely upon a protein to help them across. 
Okay, so here you can see I've typed up exactly the same definition, but with one extra detail, we've got the help of a transport protein. Let's draw that. Okay, so again, I've got my plasma membrane. Okay, and again, I'm going to have my molecules. So I'll draw them a different color this time. So here we are. Again, we've got our plasma membrane. Of course, you'd write a note to say that it's a plasma membrane, and here's our molecules, but they can't get across because even though there is a concentration gradient, they can't cross the plasma membrane. What they need is they need the help of a special protein to help them across. So you might draw that um, just as a little square and label it channel protein and then show that they move through it using arrows to help you. Okay, so we've got a plasma membrane, we've got a protein channel labeled, and we're showing that the molecules are moving across. There's more on one side, less than the other, and that's why they're moving in that direction. They're following the concentration gradient. All right, the last passive type of transport transport is osmosis. Now, this is a special case of diffusion that only applies to water. Okay, so it's again passive. Again, we're moving a semi-permeable membrane. Again, we're following the concentration gradient. We're moving away from where there's lots of water to where there's little water. But this time, it's only water that's moving. It's no other molecule. So again, I've copied and pasted that exact definition down but notice i've changed it instead of molecules it's water let's draw it so there's our plasma membrane there's our water molecules and there's um, a difference in concentration you can see that there's lots of water over here and only a little bit of water over here and we can see that i've given a little bit of a legend so that we know what the water molecules are to help with the perspective of um, concentration I've included a solute as these big purple dots now that could be anything it could be sugar salt whatever um, but you have to realize that water is the solvent now because you've got lots of dots to three dots here and um, a few blue dots to three big dots there the water is going to want to move across to balance the number of water dots so it's following the concentration gradient and you would show that with just a couple of arrows if you're using colors use color to help you out to um, with labeling things. Okay, I'm gonna take a break here and put the next bit of information on another video. So that's the top done. Um, we will do active transport next and then work our way through the rest of this um, key knowledge in another video. Okay, thank you guys.